Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Friend Steve Kading, before we get into the show, I wanted to mention that Team has supported this particular podcast, and I'm really grateful for them reaching out to us. And they mentioned that they would like to give uh, members of the Myopia Podcast community a $250 discount off of their first virtual assistant. If you have not considered uh, bringing in a virtual team, uh, I can attest to how wonderful it is. Over the last two years, we brought in. Uh, about 10 team members onto our uh, practice. We've used different staffing services and we've had issues over the years with our staff not getting paid, having issues here or there, issues with the communication. And that has been really taken care of since we've joined up with team and their uh, their group of virtual people. Uh, it's been fantastic and I would highly recommend that you consider doing it for your office. They can do things by answer the phone for you. They can uh, check uh, insurances. They can get give patients calls. They can check on uh, scribing for you in the exam room and do a host of different things, particularly in the myopia community. It's great to have somebody that can be in charge of these sort of things, checking on those myopic patients, seeing how they're doing, giving them a care call after they've had orthokeratology for a day, uh, and just kind of be a right hand to you in the exam room or to your billing team or your front desk. Consider hiring team.com, H-I-R-E-T-E-E-M.com, or click the show notes to get the $250 discount when you sign up. Now back to the show. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. I am stoked to be joined by Sherman Tung. We are uh, recording live from the Vision by Design meeting in Chicago, 2023. Uh, for those of you who have never been to a Vision by Design, Sherman is a legacy guy here. He's been coming to the Vision by Design forever. And uh, there's going to be another meeting in 2024. So start setting aside some time, October 2nd through the 5th. Do you know where the meeting is? It's going to be in Dallas, That's Texas. That's right, Dallas, Texas. We're stoked. Uh, so start setting aside in your calendar to be at the meeting. Boot camp is fantastic. Everybody should do it at some time. Uh, and then the rest of the meeting is just new, innovative, great stuff happening in the world of orthokeratology and myopia management. And another great thing in the world of orthokeratology and myopia management is Sherman's practice. Uh, you've got a practice up in BC. Tell us a little bit about you and your practice. Uh, so we're located, our, our office is called iLab, Doctors Optometry. We're located in Vancouver, BC, in Canada. So just a little bit north of Seattle. Yeah. Um, so we kind of mostly specializes in um, pediatrics. So we do a lot of um, myopia management and also vision therapy. Uh, but yeah. we just started to do a little bit of dry eyes too. So um, like IPL and yeah. frequency. So. And you've historically done eye exams as well, but primarily you're doing the specialty stuff, right? Yeah, well, the the new office is mostly just doing specialty yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah, you know, we haven't really had a conversation around this, and this isn't necessarily what I want to talk about mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. But my friend Barry Iden practiced in uh, here in Chicago, and his team did vision therapy, and he did myopia management. I do uh, multi. I do uh, myopia management. My wife does vision therapy. Uh, you know, Tan Mai in uh, Southern California, they do vision therapy. And there's just this incredible collaboration and partnership. And for people who are like, I want to do more myopia management, but I don't know if I have a practice big enough for it. People are like, I want to do vision therapy, but I don't know if I have a big enough practice for it. What an incredible marriage, right? Of those two things in practice. Was it purposeful? I think just one of my goals and like I just want to do more pediatric stuff even though my residency was in ocular disease yeah. I just feel that you can start solving a lot of the eye diseases stuff if you can treat them earlier so that's kind of be more preventive care than more like a reactive care yeah yeah absolutely so talking about preventative care you know uh, you were one of those people who you have been appropriately measuring axial length for years and years and years and uh, we know that far more people developed myopia and progressed in their myopia during COVID. 
Uh, what has changed in your mode of practice since COVID, specifically with regards to axial length measurements and how you're checking people? Are you doing anything different than you did before, or is it you know back to the same old? Well, I'll kind of give you a little bit of history of why I got the axial length. Um, the first thing I got was because after you do ortho K, how do you really know if it's getting worse or not? And there's just so much refractive noise. So you don't, unless you do a washout, which is not usually possible, you don't know if it's really getting worse or not. Like you can check their VAs, you can have them put the lenses on and check their VAs, but it wasn't very accurate. Um, so that's when I got the um, biometer and able to measure how long the eyeball, you can track it much easier. So if you know the axial length isn't really growing, then you know that your treatment is fine. Um, but if you start seeing it growing longer than what it should be, according to the growth curves, then you really want to add an extra treatment like add atropine or yeah. those. So it's not just, and, 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 and I'm saying this to preaching to the choir here, but it's not just the refractive error that's progressing, especially for ortho K where it's really tough. You're able to use uh, axial length as a way to, to kind of guide that and as we know, and we've known this for years, but it was reiterated here at Vision by Design, axial length changes only mean one thing. You have to correlate it to age. Because mm -hmm. an axial length change for a six-year-old mm -hmm. of 0.1 millimeter over the course of a year is gonna mean something totally different to you than a 15-year-old with a 0.1 millimeter. And I'm sure you have all those numbers in your head by now, right? A little bit, but uh, <laughs> today I, we had a talk from uh, Dr. Maria Liu, just learning a little bit more about it, how she gets goes to the next level. Yeah. So I'll probably get, incorporate some of that into my practice. So that's yeah. one great thing about VBD, you learn so much and then you can still incorporate it to your practice. What do you think you learned from her that is gonna be something you might be incorporating? What was something that stuck out? I think she just went from age first, then she went into the uh, ethnicity, and then she also, and like she has three or four different charts like where she uses, and then she also was talking about, you know, what the P50 was and how she doesn't use that anymore. So um, I kind of used that before a little bit, but now explain what that is for people. Um, so what P50 is, what she was trying to mention was, um, for example, if the, pa oh, if the patient. Um, Let's say there are axial, okay, sorry. Um, okay, so let's say a patient's six year old and there should be 23 yeah. millimeters. Um, and then let's say at the 50 percentile is 24. And then let's say the yeah. 90 percent is 25 millimeter. So usually we look at 24, hey, that's above, 24.2 will be it's higher than P50. P50, yeah. so that's how she looked at it. But she's like, just look at the charts according to their um, age and ethnicity. So I'm probably gonna get write her email or something tell her like hey which exact charts are you using so that yeah. way i'll be a little bit more accurate yeah yeah we've had her on the podcast she's phenomenal and hopefully we'll be able to get her back to talk more about these uh these charts so we'll stay tuned for that how else are you using axial length now different than you, you did in the past um so usually the main reason was hey let's look at your axial length and see the progression like noise um, but there's a lot of parents coming up with their siblings and they're like how about my kid? And, you know, well, they're plain or, or let's say they're plus 75 and, you know, oh, I think they should be fine. I've been doing that for a while, but within the past year, I've been like, hey, let's just measure the axial length and see what happens. Um, so sometimes you'll be surprised. You'll see a patient with, you know, flat case, like 40 or 41, and, you know, you find out their axial length is like 24, 25. It's like, again, with that P, is like the P80 or, P90, like, you know, we have to be a little bit more aggressive, you know, yeah. either a really track their outdoor time or, you know, you have to kind of think about atropine drops. Um, and the last thing that we're lucky in Canada we have is uh, anti-myopia glasses. So right. we, I am starting to, you know, parents are very, very worried, like, what can I do? I don't want to just go outdoor time. So, and I don't want to do atropine drops. So we have the glasses part but there's no studies that shows that but at least that's some sort of preventative and hopefully some studies will show it yep yep and uh jeff Wallin was here and he was talking about how do we stop myopia from starting a five six seven year old who is uh an emetrope or a hyperope uh you know if you're a plus a quarter and you're six years old you're in trouble right mm -hmm. uh but those patients don't come into the office 
and you need to get those kids outside. Mm -hmm. Uh, But he also shared that in the studies, they talked to parents about kids going outside more often and it changed zero behavior, right? They didn't, they didn't send their kids outside at all. Uh, and so kicking them outside at recess is the important thing. Well, I can give you some tips that I tell my... Yeah. Um, because usually whenever a kid comes in and they're like about pre my the mom's like, see, I told you to go outside. Um, and then usually I'll just look at the parents. I was like, well, you're also responsible also. So some of the things I will ask them, do you drive them to school? They're like, yeah, I always drop them off. I was like, well, let's drop them off five blocks away from school. <laughs> and then both of you will walk together so you guys can bond drop them out of school and then walk back to your car. At least that will give you an extra 15 to 30 minutes. Yeah. And the parent looks at me and is like, what? I'm responsible too? I was like, yeah, because it has to be, right. in order to change behaviors, the whole family has yeah. to buy in. You can also ask them if they have a lock on the door at their house. Mm-hmm. They can lock their child outside <laughs> and not let them in and <laughs> just keep them outside for longer. Uh, yeah. I haven't tried that yet, but I'll look into that. But uh, you bring up a great point as we think about myopia as you know now we're calling a disease but it's it's not the number it's not the refractive error and this is the new definition of myopia that uh, that i'm implementing into my practice is it's a progressive disease that causes eyeball growth resulting in higher disease risks blurred vision and changing prescriptions right so you just you just nailed it right what if you have a 24 millimeter eye at six years old but you're plus a quarter, right? Mm -hmm. Like, is that a problem? Yes, that kid's eyeball is way longer than it should be at 24. And we're really not concerned about, you know, from a health perspective, we don't care what the number of the refractive error is. We care about how long their eyeball is, right? Exactly, yeah. Are um, Are you doing axial length on every patient now? Is that something that you've started to do or most patients? Right now, I'm mostly just doing for my myopia consults or like kids that are, you know, the older siblings part of, you know, doing myopia control treatments, then I will also do the sibling. But after today, I think like, again, I'll be changing. I'll probably be doing on all kids. Mm -hmm. And because I used to give the option, like, do you want to have your axial lamp uh, checked? I think I'm going to be implementing that. It's kind of mandatory. So that way I can really track, you know, the axial length because... That's what I've been doing for the past couple of months. And I can see some of these kids are jumping much higher than mm-hmm. they are. And I'm like, hey, let's let's start something. Because usually yeah. I'll be like, oh, they're still plus 75. They're, it's fine. But I really don't have that data to support what I'm doing was correct. So yeah. now if I see their axial length, it's like, hey, it's on track. It's not really getting longer. Then I feel much more conf- confident yeah. now. So I'll be changing how I practice when I get back. Yeah. There. And the instruments are becoming better and better. So, for example, I have the Myopia Master. And part of the reason why I wanted the Myopia Master was because it does auto refraction and auto K's and uh, pro- I- I- biometry all in one, de- one device. What I love about that is for our eye exam patients, every patient who comes in the door that I do auto refraction on, we just capture that one more data point whether they're a kid or an adult. And the beautiful thing about the kids, right? So you see this patient back after, you know, they've been four or five, six years old, if you've been able to capture the data, and now they're six or seven years old and you're concerned about myopia, what does the mom ask? Well, what was, the, what was that length of the eyeball before, right? And, and I, I, I didn't have it before. But now we have all that data leading up to us to be able to, if in the future we need to make a change and need to have a case for it, we've got that data for axial length right there. The other great thing about it is for the parents who are coming in and, you know, they're LASIK and they don't, they did, they did post LASIK and they didn't remember what the refractive error was. Uh, you know, they're new and we're like, oh, you know, your eyeball is really long. Uh, do you have any kids? And it opens the door to this conversation around myopia being a progressive disease that causes uh, you know, eyeball elongation and leads to higher disease risk. Where in a group of people, we never measured that for the past 30 years. So it opens the door to conversations when you can do axial length on most everybody. Actually, for one of my... Um Actually, another thing I'm incorporating axial length is on people that did laser eye surgery. Yeah. So because sometimes I want to know, though I don't remember what my prescription is, but by checking the axial length, you kind of have an idea of what they might have been. And 
this is kind of a funny story. I have patients that come and say, see, look, Dr. Tang doesn't wear glasses. You know, he, you know, he follow all these rules. Like, no, 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 no. I have, I have a high prescription of was like minus eight. I did get PRK done. Yeah. Measure my own axial length. I'm like 28. So, and then I can see signs of epiretinal membrane already. All right. yeah. So yeah. when I show it to the parents, the parents will be like, whoa. Yeah. So yeah. Um, even I'm worried about it. Yeah. 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 I'd be remiss to not always mention these statistics, and I, I have them right here in front of me. When we talk about axial length for the vast majority of people who don't have a device, they've never looked at these numbers. So when we think about, say, a six, seven, eight-year-old, what are kind of some numbers that are normal that you would think about for a, a kid in that arena? 23? Usually, like, you know, my number is like, Usually anything under 23 or 23.5, I'm a little bit more, usually I go by the growth curve and each one's like different, right? Yeah. So, but usually anyone, yeah. So, so give me a, like a flag, it'll be 23 for me. But usually if I look at it a little bit more then sometimes you might want to be closer to, according to your data to be, but closer to 22.21. But yeah, but you kind of know once you look at, that's why when I chart it, like, a, like, you know, like your myopia, Master and all the other ones, they have these growth curves. They'll tell you what the P50 mm -hmm. is. So usually if they're not on that normative graph on top of it, you'll let the parents know. Yeah. So, you know, a 22.5 would be right around where a six, seven-year-old would be. 23 millimeters would be around a nine, ten-year-old. Mm -hmm. So those are numbers, you know, just to kind of keep in mind. And to give us some perspective, if we see patients who have a 24 before the age of 25 years of age, uh, that's, that's also scary. You know, we, we should be at about 23 and a half by the time we um, you know, are 20 years old or graduating high school. And uh, we bring those numbers up because there's a study that was done in, in individuals that I believe were over the age of 79. And uh, they looked at their risk of visual impairment being visual acuity worse than 2040. If their axial length was larger, uh, was smaller than 26, the risk of them developing a visual impairment, 3.8%. Over 26, one out of four of them would lose their vision with visual impairment. And if they're over 30, nine out of 10 of them will have a visual impairment of less than 2040 vision. So by knowing these numbers and these numbers becoming common, you see somebody who is, you know, uh, 30 years of age and they have a 29 uh, axial length, who cares what the refractive error is? that's somebody you're going to watch far closer. But what has been surprising to me, and maybe since you've been doing this longer than I have, is I have patients who are a four or a five, and I'm like, oh no, we're worried about your retina, and they've got an axial length of 24. And you're like, oh, really, we don't need to be worried about you. Because again, it's not the prescription, it's the axial length. That's, that's correct. So that's why it's kind of like a magic you know, crystal ball measuring the axial length and um, it's a very useful tool and been doing all my talks just saying this is kind of going to be like a gold standard like yeah. OCT for your glaucoma. Yeah. What do you think is keeping us back from becoming this the gold standard and when do you think that will become the case for us? I think, you know, like doing these podcasts and having these uh, conferences, you know, building more awareness. Um, some things, you know, any type of, as I, was, I didn't know this, but like it seems like any type of new it takes a while to change people's like doctors' behaviors, yeah. and um, you know, and also educating parents, and then also pediatric ophthalmologists. I mean, this is the part where you know we have to do our part and spread the word. But that's the only way. Like, we kind of follow the crowd. Like, whatever is sexy or whatever is, uh, hey, everyone is doing it. Then we mm -hmm. we follow very quickly. But yeah. uh, it, but sometimes it takes. But I think we're at that tipping point. So I think it's a lot more people are aware of axial length and you can yeah. see a lot of these companies here are like really promoting myopia control now. Yeah, the, uh, I, I, I agree with you, that awareness, but you know, innovation with technology has to happen at the same time. You know, it'd be very difficult to get 10 or 20,000 eye care providers across the country to just buy an IOL master 
which is designed for cataract surgery, mm -hmm. right? And th there's others that have been out forever and ever. But when you are starting to get devices that can take the place of other devices that are in your office, topo topography plus biometry, uh, auto refraction plus biometry, right? When you can start getting your OCT that can do it, when all these other devices are available to us, then when it's time for you to replace something, get something with a biometer, right? Yeah, agreed. Yeah, yeah. Any closing statements on uh, axial length and how it's the bee's knees? Um, just good praise to acquire again. Axial length's here to stay, and how we're going to be managing my OPL will be measuring axial length. Absolutely. Thank awesome. You. Thanks for being on the podcast, my man. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia podcast. Uh, we're recording live from the Vision by Design 2023 meeting. Uh, make sure to uh, look into the AAOMC's website and social media for information about the 2024 meeting in Dallas, Texas, October 2nd through the 5th. You're going to be there. Yeah, I'll be there. All right, good. Thanks again for joining us, and uh, make sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you again next time on the Myopia Podcast. Thanks for listening to this episode. I want to again thank Team for their support of this particular podcast. Uh, they have been a great supporter of the Myopia community, helping to uh, make clinicians and offices run better, whether it's calling and scheduling appointments, whether it's answering the phone, helping with billing issues, scribing in the exam room, whatnot. Having a virtual team member in your practice is a real show stopper. So with that, I want to thank team again for their support. Check them out at hireteam.com. That's H-I-R-E-T-E-M.com or click the notes in the show description below. Thanks again to team. One, two, three, four. Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.